And then we can find string exponentiation as repeated concatenation with itself of a string. And language exponentiation is repeated concatenation of a language with itself. And so we also define a uh, string uh, language complementation by right? taking all the strings that are not in the language. And we define uh, sigma star as the full closure of the union of all finite powers of a language, right here. Uh, language intersection, union, difference, the set operators, pretty straightforward. And uh, we said that sigma star contains all strings, all finite strings, but no infinite strings. That's the free closure operation applied to the alphabet. And then we defined uh, the trivial language to be the language containing the empty string, the trivial language is the empty language. Uh, we proved the theorem that sigma star is countable. Uh, the way we prove that is one word right here, dovetailing. Right? Using the accusation, we show that to the sigma star, the power set of sigma star, the set of the languages, is uncountable. And we went through the arguments for that question. So, um, we proved that uh, like B star is uncountable, and then we infinite? No, we proved that it's countably infinite. Yeah. You can count it. So, does that mean that uh, whenever you have an opinion, if we assume that if you have a finite union of finite sets, uh, it's either finite or countably infinite. Uh, even if you have a finite union of countable sets, or even a countable union of countable sets, that's still countable. But that if you have uh, a countable union of finite sets, that's not necessarily countable, right? If you take one as a set, that's a finite set. Two as a set, that's a finite set. But take the union of one and two and three and four and five and all the integers, countable union of finite sets, like one element sets, and you get the integers, all the integers, which is not finite. So be careful when you apply an operator an infinite number of times. It's not the same as applying it a finite number of times. Something can break, yeah. No, and what's the proof of that? What, what's the proof that you cannot take two countable sets, uniting them together, all of a sudden get magically an uncountable set? What's a simple proof of that? One word. <laughs> Dovetail. Why? Because you can go zigzag back and forth, number them one, two, three, four, five, six, two to two set, jump back and forth. Number them with that integer, and you count it all, even though there's two infinite countable sets you need to get. Okay. It's a good question, and it's good to get your mind wrapped down tightly around these concepts before we get too far along because everything will build on these concepts. Yeah. Um, without proof for the second one, um, instead of diagonalization, saying that the power set of the uh, yes, you can say that, but then you need to prove that. Okay. 
That's a theorem, it's not an axiom, it's not a definition. So if you can prove that, that this is a corollary, sure. But you need to prove that. It's not hard to prove. You can prove that using diagonalization. <laughs> but that's a much more general result than what I'm asking here. Is that any set, taking the power set of it, bumps you up to a higher cardinality. That's actually true for finite sets. Too. The power set of the finite set is two to the power of that set, which is always larger than the degree and the you know, cardinality of that finite set. Even a set of zero elements, taking the power set of that, it's the set containing the empty set, which has one element. That's one is bigger than zero. So it's even true for pathological examples. Uh, any other questions so far? So, you know, we spend a lot of time on these definitions because they're very, very important. Everything else we'll build on these definitions. There's a, there's a lot going on there in these definitions. All right, so, you know, as far as where we are in the course right now, we're starting chapter one, about finding automata, so hopefully all of you are reading chapter one. Uh, pretty seriously, and soon there'll be a homework set involving finite automata and other things. With a few days, we'll release that. So, what is a finite automata? It's the sort of the simplest model of computation, the non-trivial model of computation that, that we know that we have. So basically, it's a machine that changes states. So we have a set of states, right? We just arbitrarily call them Q0, Q1, Q2, just labels. So differentiate the fifth from the seventh state and so on. And then you have a transition function that takes you from a state and an input character and gets you into another state. That other state could still be the same state as you were right now, but some state other than going nowhere. I mean, we denote graphically the states using circles, using ovals labeled with their name. And the transition function usually is denoted with arrows so you know, the state transition function will look like a graph, a bunch of nodes with denoting states and the arrows will denote transitions. So for example, if you're in state Q1 and you see some particular character, you jump to state Q, uh, you know, Q2 or whatever it is, Qi to Qj more generally. Um, there's some initial states where you start the computation, you start from a particular state, not just from an arbitrary state, you've know, you got to start somewhere. So we call that arbitrarily we call it Q0. So that's one of the states in the state set here. Okay, and we have a final state set, and that's a set, not necessarily a single state. It's a, it could be a set containing one state, but it could be a set containing 17 final states. That's where we end the computation. The computation ends in some final state, as opposed to a non-final state. The computation is said to be an accepting computation, and the string that we saw in input is in the language associated with that final computation. So the finite automata is simply the ordered tuple representing all these values, right? The uh, set of states, the alphabet, the transition function, the initial state, and the set of final states. That's all it is uh, in terms of definitions or notations, but there's very deep, complicated, non-trivial implications of all this. What these machines can do, what they can't do, how they operate, how they can be manipulated, augmented, modified, made to do certain things. Just like programming, the rules of programming are pretty straightforward. Right? There's an assignment statement, and uh, there's uh, an if-then else statement, and you know, there's some sort of loop. Besides that, there's not a whole lot else going on. There's a few data structures, integers, reals, and arrays. So the most basic building blocks, you can do a lot. In fact, everything we do as computer scientists arises from these few building blocks. Same thing will happen here. A few simple rules, a few simple building blocks and definitions, and a lot will arise from that. Yeah. Uh, so Q is a set of states, not an alphabet. So the alphabet is sigma, and Q is a set of states completely separate from sigma. Uh, they're not even the same type. Q is a set of states, sigma is a set of characters. A state is not a character. A character is not a state. Right? So, so by adding characters to the state, you get a different state? Uh, by being in a state and seeing a character in the input, we switch to another state, we transition to another state, based on what we're looking at. So it's not that we're adding. Adding is not quite the right word. We're observing a character, and based on it, as a function of it, we switch to another state. Or, so I want to be very precise in my answers, so there's no confusion about type, much less values of objects. Yeah. Uh, the final states is some subset of the actual states that we declare to be final or accepting. 
So if you end up in an accepting state by the time the computation is over, we'll see, we'll see examples of this very soon, or next slide, in fact, very quickly. So if you're in a final state after you've exhausted the input, you accept the input. And then that input is part of your language, you being the final account. Uh, let's get a little bit ahead and then we'll see if some of these questions are clarified. If not, we'll take more questions. So here's an example. Um, two states, Q0 and Q1. Here's the initial state. Notice everything is color coded. Initial state, right, is purple. Uh, final state is red and double oval, as opposed to just single ovals for non final So I'm color coding everything very intentionally here to make it even clearer. Um, and the transitions are represented in blue. The transition function is in blue. Delta here is in blue. Blue arrow, blue arrows. So here's a finite automata. An input comes in the door, and the finite automata starts operating on that input from the, from the initial state. So in this example, you're in the initial state, this purple state. And if you see a zero, you jump here. If you see, if you're here in the second state, Q1, you see a zero, you jump back to the first state, Q0. And if you see another zero, you go here, another zero, you go here. And at the end, when you exhaust all the input characters, let's say seven zeros come in as the input. Seven, not six, not eight, but seven zeros. You start here in Q0. Which state will you end up after seeing seven zeros based on these transition rules? Now, if your question is pretty straightforward. Q1. Q1. In fact, if you see any odd number of zeros, you'll always be in Q1. If you see an even number of zeros, you'll be back to Q0 because you're jumping back and forth. So this little machine here, just like the thumb up, counts parity. Counts the number of zeros you're seeing in the input. Assuming sigma is only zero. The alphabet only contains the character zero and nothing else. We're not concerned about ones right now. Let's say it's not, ones are not even in the input, so they don't even count, we don't even expect to see it. All right, how many understand this machine will accept all odd length strings made of zeros? Okay, and no even length strings made of zeros. Okay. And how do we know it accepts a string? Well, a string comes to the door and it goes through the string recognition and state transitions based on the characters of the string. The only process is to get each character once. You know, like the read state of C or C++, every time you read a character, you read in the next character, the next character, you don't reread the initial character that you already read, unless you go back in an input or store the input or whatever. So after you exhaust the entire input, you end up in this final state, if and only if you see an odd number of characters, you see an even number of characters, you end up in the initial state, but that's not a final state, so you don't accept. That's how this machine works. So technically, the machine is defined as a set of states, a, a, a alphabet, a transition function, an initial state, the final state, and here it is all expanded out for this example. So the set of states is brace Q0, comma Q1 unbrace. Two states and two states only. That's the green, green color-coded set of states. And it's fine, that's only two of them. Here's the alphabet, the second component of the definition of the machine. The alphabet is simply the one character zero symbol zero or nothing else. It's a very simple alphabet. Uh, the transition functions where all the action happens for the definition of the machine. Right? So the transition function consists of these two transitions. If you're in Q0 and you see a zero, you go to Q1. If you're in Q1 and you see a zero, you go to Q0. So these sort of mimic these two arrows here in order tuple notation. And these are tuples. There's two pairs, two ordered pairs, the first element of each one of these two pairs is an ordered pair itself. It's a combination of a state and a symbol. And that satisfies the definition of the type of this function that is a transition function. This function takes you from a domain of states cross symbols. That means a, a pair of a state and a symbol taken as a ordered pair and ends you up in some other state from the state side. So here's a state and a symbol and here's the state that you'll end up with if you follow this transition as opposed to other transitions. All right, so that's the blue transition function definition here, color-coded blue, that's the delta right here, this delta there. And Q0 is simply the initial state right here. And a little carrot denotes that it's the initial state. You've got a part of a little arrow going into it, so you know where to start. You gotta start somewhere. You can start everywhere or nowhere. You gotta start somewhere if you're a programmer with 
computer or even a person. There's an initial step where you start. Um, and then the set of final states. So this is not a state, it's a set of states. In this case, there was only one of them, color coded red, but there could be more than one. Okay, so how many understand this definition here, this kind of tedious long notation definition of this picture, which is the equivalent representation, just long hand. Usually, a picture suffices, like in a homework or on an exam, or when you need to draw them up. You know, it's better to draw them up this way than that way. This is more precise, but this is more intuitive, and you can sort of see the picture and follow the arrows, and you know, it, it's, it's like representing a program in C++ or in machine language, right? I mean, both are very perfectly valid equivalent representations, but you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, so it's nicer to represent it like this, or you can even represent in English, saying, here's what the machine would do. There would be two states, and everything I said in English, if you write as a long paragraph, that's also an okay way to describe a machine, but just to be on the safe side, maybe add this description too, so it's very clear. There's no transitions missing, nothing is left out, there's no ambiguities, and everything's accounted for. It's like writing out a piece of code or just describing it in English. The English description may leave something wanting or something missing, and the actual code is probably a more, more precise description. Question? Is it possible for one state to be both the initial state and one final Good question. She's asking, is it possible for a state to be both an initial state and a final state both at the same time? How many say yes? How many say no? It's good. The vast majority, almost unanimous vote, actually. Unanimous vote, and yes, so the answer is yes. Usually the majority is right. Uh, it's a very interesting question when the majority is wrong, because a lot of people are about to write something. But let's say you weren't sure about that. How would you determine that from the slide if the initial state can be a final state? Well, you look at the definitions, right? The initial state is an element of Q. The final state is a subset of Q. There's no other constraint on what the initial state or the final state can be or not be as long as one is an element of Q and one is a subset of Q. So that element of Q can actually be part of that subset of Q. Right? So if you're not sure, you can always go back to the definitions and that helps clear things up. It's a very good practice, very good thing to do. That's why we harp on definitions so much because most of the answers to these things will eventually lie in the definitions when you go back and check them and see if it makes sense or is allowed by the definitions. Okay, any other thoughts so far? Yeah. Okay, what do you mean by accepts? Accepts. So we're about to define that in the next slide. Very good question. So the finite automata consumes an input stream, one symbol at a time, and changes states. And it accepts if and only if it ends up in a final state at the end of all these transitions after it processes the entire input beginning to end. So that's what we mean by accept. And rejection is everything else that's not accepted. And the reason I say everything else is it's, it's not just ending in a non-final state, but sometimes a transition function is not defined for a particular state character combination. If it's not defined, the machine kind of hangs up. It's like a like a condition in, in your code, some sort of a condition in your code that's not accounted for and there's nowhere to branch to, and the code just kind of hangs because there's nothing to do at that moment. Right? So if you do that, um, you can define anything other than accepting by being in the final state. Anything other than that is a rejection, either explicitly by being in a non-final state or implicitly by having nowhere to go. And it's an undefined transition. It's like a program crash, in a sense. So if your program crashes, it certainly didn't do its job or give you a correct input. By definition, a crash is not a correct input. If it's a soft stop, deliberately, maybe it's a correct input. But not if it's just a, a raw crash, like a ray out of bounds or some other hard error condition. That, that's not an acceptable outcome for a piece of code or a machine. And that's definitely not a, an accepting state or accepting the string in the input that it's solved. Yeah? So the transition function is defined as a cross between the language and all the states. So how could you end up, how could you not have a transition function defined for Good question. He's saying that the transition function is defined as this type, but this is just a type. It's not the definition. So for example, I can think, I can define the square root as a as a function from reals to reals. Right? But then what's the square root of minus five? It's undefined in the reals. Now if you want to imaginary numbers or complex numbers, then you can try to define it there. So this is not the actual definition of the function right here, it's a statement of its type. 
and the type is an ordered pair of a state and a symbol as the range as a domain, and the range is just a state, a single state. And sure enough, if you look here, you see an ordered pair as a domain and a, and a, and a uh, state as a range. And this this uh, notation here, depicting this machine, satisfies this type. Right? So again, being very particular and intentional and precise about the words and types and the definitions, that's what it means. Any other thoughts or questions so far? Okay, so the final automata accepts all strings that ends it up in an accepting state, in a final state, and nothing else. So that's the language accepted by that final automata. Is any string that will cause it to do that. Start from the initial state, process that string, and ends up in the final state. So now you know what the language of a machine is, how it's defined. Any, any thoughts or questions about that? And that's kind of a general definition that applies to push down automata for Turing machine, for stack automata, for Q automata, for lots of other types of machine models. And we'll get into all those, but this definition is pretty general across all these uh, computation models. All right, so let's do another example. A finite automata that accepts all strings of the form a, B, A, B, A, B. In other words, it's A, B star represented as a regular expression. We'll, we'll talk about regular expressions as a subject in its own right, but for now, I assume you know what I, uh, I mean when I say A, B quantity star. It's any number of A, Bs, including zero. Uh, and this star, of course, is a clean closure we defined two slides ago. Two slides ago. All right, so here's a machine. Uh, the initial state is Q0, this double. Uh, this, this state here with a little carrot going into it. The, another state is Q1. If you see an A, you go here. If you see a B, you go there. And here's an example of a machine which was asked earlier. Can the initial state be a final state? In that machine, it is, actually. The initial state is Q0. Q0 is also a final state, and the only final state in this example. Okay, so again, here's the formal definition. I won't have to go through all that. It's very similar to the previous example. But this machine will accept any string of the form A, B, a, B, A, B, A, B, any number of A, B combinations. But you have to have a, can't end with an A, and it can't start with a B, and so you can have two A's in a row, you cannot have two B's in a row. All these strings that I just mentioned will not be in this language of this machine. How many get this? Okay, pretty straightforward. Questions? All right, question up there. What if you get like two A's in a row? Ah, so if you get two A's in a row, what will this machine do? You start here, you see one A, you go here. Here, now you'll see the other A, the next A. What do you think is going to be the outcome of that situation? You're in Q1, you see an A. If you look at this, the, the state transition function is not defined for an A if you're in state Q1. So the machine will hang. It's like a crash. And if that machine will hang, guess what? You're in the anything else category, including this crash. So that will not be an acceptable string that is in the language, A, A. And neither will B, B, two Bs. But neither will B, A, and so on. Now, let's say you wanted to not have crashes. You wanted explicitly to either reject or, reject or accept every string by being in the right state with respect to acceptance, a rejection or an accepting state. So you can modify it to not crash. And you can do this with any machine you want. And here is what we'll do. We'll add extra definitions for the ones that are missing, the state transitions that are missing. So here is your A transition here that we just asked about. Here is your B transition from the initial state. If you're in here and you see a B, you go there. And here in, your, in this new state Q2, if you see an A or a B, you keep cycling and you're remaining now in state Q2 and there's no way to exit state Q. State Q, Q2 only has arrows going into it, not arrows coming out of it. But now all transitions are defined. In every state, whether you see an A or a B, you have an arrow there into some other state, and everything is completely well defined. So now delta is completely defined. So to answer that question that was asked earlier, um, here delta is everywhere defined. It doesn't have to be, but now it is. And this machine here will still accept the exact same language as before, A, B star. How many see that? Because if you see anything other than an A and a B followed by an A and a B and an A and a B, any number of them, if anything is out of whack and you see a B out of turn after seeing another B, or you see an A after another A, anywhere in the street, you'll end up in this garbage state, this kind of dead-end cul-de-sac state that will ne never get you out of it and will certainly never get you to an accepting state, but the machine will never crash now because it's everywhere to find. 
It's like having a case statement where all possible branches are defined to cover all possible eventualities, and always one of the branches is triggered. It's never implicit or unaccounted for. So all possible situations are now accounted for in this form. How we understand this this what we just did? Okay, any questions about that? And you could do this for any machine that you'd like. Any machine that's partially defined, wherever it's not defined, take the case where it's not defined and deliberately go into some garbage collecting state that will end up there and never exit there and it's not accepting state, do not pass go, do not collect $200, you'll stay there and reject it. And you can always have a machine that will do that if the machine doesn't do that already for every possible combination of state, symbol, pair. Okay. We good so far? Okay. So the transition function can be extended from symbols to strings notationally, inductively, or recursively, if you will, as follows. You can say the transition function delta, and by the way, delta usually represents change, right? Or a difference from something to something else in mathematics or calculus, delta is usually represented by change. And that's why I use the letter delta here, because it seems kind of intuitively representing of a change of a state, as opposed to a change between two quantities like calculus. Uh, so delta here, a transition function, you can define it when you have q0 and you assume a string w followed by the, the character x as first from that state q0, process the w. When you're done, process using delta again, whatever state you end up with, that's the output of this inner inside delta, whatever state you end up with there, comma, whatever symbol x is, and then go there again. So whereas if you're changing from a state to some other state, but you see nothing. In other words, you're not processing an input symbol, you remain in that same state. So that's the base case of the induction of the recursion, if you will, in terms of this definition. So all we're doing here is um, basically extending the definition of delta from individual symbol transitions to whole string transitions, one symbol at a time, based on this inductive definition here. How many get that? You know, it's not that deep, it's just notation, basically. Questions? Okay. So a language now formally is defined as all the strings that cause delta to go from a, the initial state to some final state. And this is precisely the definition of the language accepted by a finite automata or any other machine for that matter. The definition applies to Turing machines, to stack automata. We'll get there, but this definition is very general. So again, now we have an application to denote very succinctly, shortly, what it means for a language to be accepted by machines. Instead of strings, all of them, every string in sigma star such that the transition function takes you from that string beginning with the initial state to some final state. And this is a membership here, it's not an equality. Because the final states is a set of possibly many final states, and as long as you end up in one of them, you're good. Right? So that's why I don't have equal here, but rather set membership notation. So I'm very, very intentional here with symbols, very precise, okay? The ambiguity is no fuzziness here. It's a very, very tight, precise, intentional definition. Now, a language is said to be regular if and only if it's accepted by some finite automata. Which one? I don't care. As long as there exists a finite automata that accepts a particular language, that makes that language regular. That's a definition. That's the definition of regularity of a language. It's just a name, but it means acceptance by some finite automata. That means some finite automata can do the job. Now that's not to take for granted that some languages cannot be accepted by any finite automata. Like zero to the n, one to the n, for example. That's not acceptable by any finite automata in the universe, which is a very strong statement. It takes quite a bit of doing to prove that, actually, because it's a negative result. Proof by contradiction is proving that you're not a millionaire. That's hard to do. But we will do that soon enough, probably next week. Okay? Uh, so some languages are acceptable by, by some finite automata, and others are acceptable by no finite automata. But in the former case, those languages are regular. And that's what we're saying here. Any, any thoughts about that or questions so far? It's, it's a definition. Definition of the term regularity. Uh, it could be a series of transitions. 
So remember, here I'm representing the input as W, W is a string. But I said that you transition on a string, you're transitioning on all the characters individually via this recursive or inductive definition, one symbol at a time. So it can be a long series of transitions, a very long series. Or it can be one transition, like the string only has one character in it, and in one transition you'll know what to do with that string, it's in or out of the language. But in general, it could be many transitions. Good question. Okay. First theorem about finite automata, and we'll have a lot of theorems about it. Some of them will be more complicated than others. This one is relatively straightforward. So I'm saying complementation preserves regularity. What does that mean? If I take a language that we know is regular, that means it's acceptable to some finite automata. Some finite automata accepts that language. It's accepted by some finite automata, it makes it regular. If we take the complement of that language, sigma star minus that language, that complement is also regular. There's some other finite automata that accepts the complement of this language. If a language, and so what we're saying there is, a language is regular if and only if its complement is regular. Another way of saying this. Okay. But if the complement is regular, the complement of the complement must be regular too. I'm going to get that as a correlate. But the complement of the complement is the language itself. So a generalization of this theorem is a language is regular if and only if its complement language is also regular. How would you prove something like that? It's not hard. So for example, let me show you first an example and then show you that an example generalizes to arbitrary cases. So let's take the machine from the previous slide. This machine accepts all strings of the form AB star, right? Now, if you want to accept the complement of this language, what is the complement of this language? Well, it's all strings that are not of the form AB star. And so you sort of know what that is. It's all the strings that are not A, B, A, B, A, B. And there's many of those, infinite number, in fact. Another way of saying it is sigma star minus all the A, B star strings. So how would you have a finite automaton that accepts the complement of this language? Well, first of all, take a finite automaton that accepts this language to begin with, like this one, which we just did on the previous slide. And now what? Negate all the final and non-final states. Yeah. Uh, Q minus F? Uh, yes. So if the new F is Q minus F, you're essentially inverting the final and non-final states. You're making the states that were final, non-final, that were non-final, you make them final, and you get this new machine, M prime, and look what happened. All the transitions remain the same, and there's still the same number of states, and they're labeled the same, all the arcs are the same. The only thing that changes is this state used to be final here, double circle means final. Here it's not final. These two states, Q1 and Q2, used to be single circle, which is not final. And here they are final. So all we do is flip the red states to non-red states and vice versa. And this new machine does whatever this machine does, except that this machine was in a final state at the end and accepted, this machine will be in a non-final state at the end and reject and vice versa. How many get that? So you're sort of being contrary. This machine does the opposite of what this machine would do. It, say, it does what this machine would do until the very end, and then flips the answer from yes to no, no to yes, by negating the final and non-final states. Okay. So for every language that's regular, there's a finite automaton that accepts it, and there's another finite automaton that will accept the complement of that language, sigma star minus that language. So we just prove the theorem that complementation preserves regularity. How many get this, get this whole thing? Okay, any questions about that? Because I saw only half the class raising that. Uh, questions? So we sort of did an example, but you can see that this example generalizes to any machine. Simply complement the final and non-final states, and you'll, you'll get the machine for the complement language. Now, if you want to write the regular expression for the complement, that's a different story, that's a different exercise. But here we're doing that. So what would make a regular expression that represents the complement of AB star? Well, how, in what way can you foil AB, AB, AB as a pattern? Well, if you have two A's in a row or two B's in a row, that would be in a complement, right? So here you have sigma star AA or AB, plus means or, right? Or union. Right? So AA union DB is two strings, 
sigma star and sigma star on both hands. If you have a string of a form AA and or BB somewhere in it, and it doesn't matter what else is in it, that's going to be in a complement of the language itself. I'm going to get that. Okay. Another couple of ways to break the, the language is to, instead of starting with an A, you start with a B. Instead of ending with an A, instead of ending with a B, you end with an A. So these three ways are three ways to break this pattern of A, B star. It turns out they're the only ways. You don't need any fourth or fifth or tenth way to, to break the recoverable basis. And so this regular expression here, which is a lot more complicated than this initial regular expression, denotes the complement language of A, B star. And it therefore denotes the language of this machine and prime. Any questions about any of that? And we'll, we'll talk about regular expressions at much greater length separately as a separate issue, but this is kind of a preview of regular expression. By the way, how many heard of regular expressions before? Okay, good, well, most of you, so that, that's good. So you sort of know what they are, and we'll get deeply into that in a couple of lectures. All right, so design a finite automata, a deterministic finite automata that accepts all strings over A, B, where any A's precede any B's. So you can take any string you want to and accept it as long as all the A's precede all the B's. So what do we do? The idea is to skip over any contiguous A's and skip over any contiguous B's and then accept if you reach the end of the string and that's all there is to it. But if you see more B's after A's, it's, it's no good. So here's a machine that does the job. You start in the initial state here, Q0. If you see a lot of A's, you stay in Q0. Then the first B you see, you go to Q1, and then flush all the B's by remaining in Q1. Transition over the B's here, from Q1 to itself. And then finally, if you see another A, you go to the garbage state that you stay in, and then you never accept. But that's only if you see A, if you see any A's after some B's. But if you see only A's and stay here, then you see only B's and stay there, and then you exhaust the input completely, then you accept if and only if. And by the way, if there's any input remaining not processed, the machine must continue to operate. It, it's not, it doesn't stop in the middle of its input processing uh, stream. It must process the input to completion until the last character is reached, and then you see which state it's in, accept or reject. So how many understand this example as accepting this language where all A's precede all B's? Okay, straightforward. And you can represent the language as a regular expression, A star, B star. Again, star is the clean closure. So any number of A's followed by any number of B's. Will this accept no A's, just five B's? How many say, yeah, that will and it should? Yeah, it will and it should. Because all A's precede all B's, but there are no A's, so that condition is satisfied. Any A's will precede any B's, but there are no A's, so, so we're good at that. It's just B's. It doesn't break that rule. And by the way, the complement of A star, B star, you can represent it you know, in a number of ways, but you know, you can say some B precedes some A. So that's sigma star, B plus, sigma star, A plus, sigma star. That means a B must precede an A where it can be anything in between, anything before that B, and anything after that A, and plus means one or more. Remember, the clean closure is sigma star. Sigma plus is at least one occurrence or more of whatever it is you're putting the star on, the clean closure star operator, uh, whatever it is you're applying it to. But you can skip, keep simplifying this regular expression, and these are all equivalent regular expressions. So finally, we end up with one B preceding an A with anything in between, and here we can say as long as some B preceding an A right next to it, because if some B precedes some A with all sorts of stuff in between, and other A's and B's in between, somewhere in there, there'll be a B immediately preceding an A. How many can see that? Because you start with a B, eventually end up with an A, and it doesn't matter what else is in there, eventually there'll be a B right before an A as the previous character. See, you have to think about it a little bit, you see that's true. So these are all equivalent, and some of these expressions are much shorter than the original expression. It keeps reducing in length. This gets to the point of minimizing a regular expression, and turns out that's that's a hard problem in general. But minimizing a finite automaton to the least number of states, that's actually not so hard. There's an n log n algorithm to minimize a finite automaton. You give you the absolute minimum number of states required to still represent the exact same language as the original, but with less states. In programming, the equivalent is writing a shorter program. 
that still does the exact same job as the, as the original longer program. So you can write a 100 line program, you know, print out prime numbers, but somebody else can write a 20 line program that's kind of better, all things you know, being equal. And somebody else can write a 12 line program which generates prime numbers, and that's even shorter yet. Now there's reasons you may not necessarily want the shortest possible program, like what would be a reason why you want to, you don't want necessarily the shortest possible program to print out prime, but you want a little bit larger program preferentially. What would be a reason for that? <coughs> More readable, easier to code, easier to debug, less obfuscated and obscure in terms of what's going on. Who knows, there could be reasons for that. But still, if you want to option of minimize a piece of code, you know, uh, that, that sometimes, you know, you, you may want to do that, but for programs, it turns out it's undecidable, it's unsolvable. For finite automata, it's doable. For Turing machines, it's not doable. There's no outlook. We will prove there's no possible algorithm later, of course, to minimize a Turing machine to the least number of states. For finite automata, you can do it. We'll talk about that separately. Subject matter for itself. Are there questions? Comments? Yeah. Who decided that set of DFA? Yeah, so, um, I said, I said DFA here in a previous slide, and DFA stands for deterministic finite automata, which means that every state is only a unique, specific next state to go to and to nowhere else. Uh, very quickly, we will talk about non-determinism. Probably before today is over yet, we will talk about non-determinism. And it turns out that non-deterministic machines can only be simulated by deterministic machines when you talk about finite automata. Actually, that's also true for Turing machines. It's not true for pushed automata. But non-determinism means you have several possible next states. We're about to discuss that at much later length. But here, so far, all the machines we've seen are deterministic. There's a unique, precise next state that you go to, and it's unambiguous, and there's no other choice but to go there when you see a particular set. So that's determinism. OK, so um, there's a great tool on the web called JFLAT. Uh, it simulates finite automata, shows them Victoria, the end of the screen, allows you to run them, debug them, modify them, run them on particular inputs, clean some screenshots, and this uh, tool uh, called JFLAT can also handle Turing machines, stack automata, also can handle grammars, can convert from non-deterministic machines to deterministic machines, do all sorts of other uh, interesting transformations on machines and grammars. But I want you to all use that tool uh, very soon. In fact, the next assignment, the next homework assignment, will require you to use that tool and, and give us some screenshots as to particular implementation of simple machines and so on. So it's not designed to be onerous at all, but I want you to get used to using this finite automata kind of workbench or simulating environment uh, and play with it, play with some finite automata, modify them, observe the effect of certain modifications on their behavior, try to see what languages they accept or don't accept. You can also use this to debug your finite automata. If there's a question on the homework or you know, even on an exam saying, you know, create a finite automata that do the following, uh, you, know, you can use this tool to test if your finite automata actually does what you think it does. It's like a compiler environment, like a compilation environment or a runtime you know, debugging environment for finite automata. Any questions about that? Uh, you know, it's a really nice tool. It's, it's public domain, it's open source. It's uh, you know, been used for years, so it's quite evolved. It's, it's, uh, it can do a lot, so I want you all to, to, to use that and uh, use it all. And this kind of brings fine automata and push the automata and turn machine kind of to life, as opposed to just squiggles on a piece of paper. You can watch them run, change state, and, and so on. All right, so uh, this brings us in the book to the page 44, section 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 um, and we just proved, you know, that uh, you know, regular languages are closed under under complementation, and we're about to prove that they're closed under other operators like union and uh, intersection, clean closure, and, and so on. So in the book, we're, we're just a few sections into chapter one, so I'm showing you what you should be reading, you know, in the next week or, or two weeks. They're very explicitly here. So, Let's prove some of these theorems that we just mentioned. So, intersection preserves regularity. How do we prove that if you have a regular language and another regular language, and it could be two separate different regular languages, they're set intersection. The set of strings common to both necessarily is also a regular language. It's not obvious. It didn't have to be this way. And for other classes, it's not even true. For other classes of languages, 
like the context screen language, that theorem is false. So how do you prove something like this? So we will prove it sort of by this technique of parallel simulation. Here's what I mean. So let's say you feed, it, you feed the first finite automata for the first language, a string, and it takes you to all these transitions and ends up in a final state right here. So this is kind of a pictorial trace of the execution of the first finite automata for the first language. For the second finite automata for the second language, here is its execution, it's a different execution. These states have nothing to do with these states. It's a completely different set of states for a completely different machine. So I'm depicting, and some, by the way, some of these states, this state could be the same as this state. In fact, all four of these states could be the same state. How, how do you get that? I'm showing it abstractly, kind of diagrammatically or pictorially, but I'm not saying that all these states are different along this execution trace. I'm just saying these are the states that the machine goes through, these are the transitions the machine goes through before it finally stops and accepts. Same for this other machine, for this other language. Which language? The two languages we're trying to intersect together. So one machine will do this, another machine will do that, separately from the first machine. On the same input, on double the same input. So what are we going to do? We're going to create so-called super states that are pairs of states. Right? So I'm going to create a super state here that's made up of two initial states, a super state here that's made up of these two states, and so in fact I'm going to create super states for every combination of states from the first machine with every combination of states from the second machine. I'm going to cross product these two states, cross them together, right? Q1 cross Q2, Q1 being the state set of the first machine, Q2 being the state set of the second machine. I'm going to cross them all together in all possible combinations, ordered pairs, right? And in particular, now this super machine that has these super states, that are pairs of states, will jump from one super state to the next super state to the next super state according to a very simple rule. The super machine that will recognize the intersection of the two languages will jump from a super state to another super state if the individual two smaller transition functions for the first machine and the second machine cross together. These two simple transition functions separately may do transition from that little state to this little state and separately the other machine's transition function may do transition from this little state of the second machine to that little state of the second machine. Then the combined crossed machine for the intersection of the two languages will jump you from that super state to that super state. It's a different only if both must do the right thing, and then together that pair jumps to that pair taken as super states. Right? And that's depicted as super transition. I and mean, these are just words. I'm really defining a new transition function in blue that works on pairs of transitions in green. How many understand what's going on? Yeah, a few people. We'll try to pick up another bunch in the next three minutes here. So, what we're doing is combining pairs of states into larger super states and defining a super transition function in blue based on the little pair of transition functions of the original two machines, which, you know, giving you these transitions. So these big jumps here operate in parallel on pairs of transitions, one in the first machine, one in the second machine. It's like running two threads together in parallel. Yeah. Parallel execution of two different threads. And the simulating environment is a super machine that keeps track of the two threads, each doing their own thing. And you want to make sure that both are doing the correct thing before you declare victory as the super machine running both threads. Is the question? Yeah. So does, is, does any state that, any super state that contains a final, like an individual final state? Is that super state final? Ah, very, very, very good question. He's saying, which are the final states of the super machine? So here's the final state of the second machine. Here's the final state of the first machine. But when this machine reaches a final state, this machine doesn't. When this first machine reaches a final state, the second one doesn't. Here is a final, here's a pair of final states for both machines, respectively. So which ones of these three, this one, this one, and this one, will be a final state, a final super state of the final super cross machine? What do you think? Does it suffice for one machine to accept, or the other to accept, or both must accept? Remember what the goal is. The goal is to accept the intersection of the two languages. Yeah? All three are accepted. All three are accepted? Any, any other thoughts?
Okay, so she's saying that that would be true if it was the union. The union would mean if one accepts, it's fine. If the other accepts, it's fine. If both accept, that's fine too. The union could be either in one set or the other set or in both. But the intersection says it's got to be in one set. And moreover, on top of that, it's got to be in the other set as well. So it's not surprising that one will accept and the other won't. That would be like a union situation, not an intersection. The intersection has got to be true of both. <coughs> the intersection of two sets, it's whatever strings appear in one set and the other set both, it's an and, it's not an or. <coughs> the intersection is an and, the union is an or. Right? So don't, don't be reluctant to answer questions. I mean, you still get points for courage, even if it wasn't exactly, you know, what's going on still, you know. If you ask questions, you know, you're helping your peers. If you have a question, chances are 20, 30, 40 people in the room have the same question, and you'll be helping them by asking. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Sorry, I'm just, I have an issue with types, I suppose. We're proving that the intersection of two languages is right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we're 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 proving that the intersection of two regular languages is also regular. And so because the two languages are regular, they each have a machine that accepts it. By definition, that's what regularity means. The machine, the final power that accepts both languages. There's a final power that accepts the first language and a final power that accepts the second language. And they're not they're not the same final power necessarily. Usually they won't. But now we're we're bashing them together and forming this hybrid intersection machine, union machine, super state machine that accepts exactly the intersection of these two languages. So whatever language this accepts, this machine accepts, it will be the intersection of these two languages, but because we define the final counter for it, that intersection is itself regular, by definition. Because if there's a final counter for it, it's regular. So that's what we're doing here. So the initial superstate is here in purple, and that's simply the initial two states. The unique pair, that's the two states or two machines in purple in small little circles here, but this big purple oval is the superstate of the, of, the, of the cross machine, of the cross product machine. Okay? And the final superstates contain only pairs, only red pairs from both machines to answer the question of union versus intersection. We're about to prove the union, uh, it will be all, these two also. But now it's intersection is um, the final states of the super machine, the cross product machine, is all super states that contain two final states, one from every machine respectively, one from each machine. Now there could be many super states, because it could be many final states in the first machine and many final states in the second machine, and all combinations of final states for the first and final states for the second will be final super states in the cross product machine. How many get that? There could be many final superstates, but only one initial superstate. That one is unique. There's only one initial state for the first machine, only one initial state for the second machine. Take that there, and that's your initial superstate for the super machine. Okay? And so this resulting deterministic final power that accepts the intersection of the two lane, the two original languages. Now, this super machine can have a lot more states than the original. I'll repeat that. The super state, super machine here, this, this, this product machine, or however you want to think about it, cross product machine, the construction here, constructive machine, can have many more states than either the first machine or the second machine. How many states at the most will this super machine have if the first machine had X states and the second machine had Y states? How many, machine, how many states can the super machine have at most? Not, not a hard question. Take a wild guess. Yep. Four. So if the first machine had a hundred states, the second machine had a thousand states, the super machine would have just a few states. Think about it more generally. But if you speak up, you're already a hero because okay. people are afraid to say anything. So, yeah. I'd say two x or two x minus one. 2x minus 1, okay. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. So the super 
So she's saying it's a product of the two sides. Any thoughts up there? There were hands up there. You want to corroborate or have a different answer? Yeah. 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 X times Y. So it's what you say. It's a product. Yeah. So you're right. It's the product of the two state sizes because they're crossing them both. They have every state from the first with every possible state from the second, all possible combinations in the worst case. Now, sometimes not all pairs will actually be, be valid and have to be represented. Some of them will not be reachable. And you can just not write them down. Right? Some states in the final time of them may not be reachable to begin with. You can have a million states out of which only two have any transition going in and out of them, including the initial state. And these other million minus two states do nothing. It's like having dead code in your program that's, that never gets called. That can happen. And if you, you know, if, if these machines have kind of dead states, they're unreachable states, you know, they won't. You know, in, in, in this cross product return, they'll also be dead and unreachable. You don't have to worry about them. There'll be a lot less than x times y states. But, but x times y is, in, is the possible maximum. So I just want you to know that. The number of states in this new machine, this hybrid super machine, will not never exceed the product of the two state sets of the two machines, respectively. And often it will be a lot less than that. So that's okay. Questions or comments? So far, yeah. So, if every character follows your case, um, either of the original functions would still be valid? That is, the super function will also uh, well, if one, of, if one of the two machines hangs and doesn't move anywhere, the construction hangs too. But, but if one moves to some state and the other moves to some other state, together the super machine will move to that new combination of the two targets of these two uh, states where the two individual machines move to. Uh, in other words, the, the, the sort of the right thing happens, the sensible thing happens. You know, if you're simulating two threads, the new state of the whole system is whatever state that thread is in, whatever state that thread is in, together as the new state of the whole simulator. I don't know if that, that sheds light on what you're asking or not. But, um, let's come back to that. There's still a question in five, five minutes. Let's address that again. So the new machine has, it's also the old machine is Q1, Delta 1, Q prime, F1. This is the state set of the first machine, the second machine. Transition function of the first machine, the second machine, delta one, delta two. Final state set of the first machine, F1, of the second machine, F2, and so on. And what's the new hybrid machine? So the hybrid machine has final state set that's a cross product of these two sets of states of the two machines, F1, F2, respectively. Right? So this is the crossed pairs of the two states coming from the two machines, respectively. The initial state is the first initial state of the first machine, comma, the first initial state of the second machine. And this Q prime prime is coming from the second machine, M2. This Q prime is coming from the first machine, M1. And that's Q prime, Q prime prime. In this picture, it's this big initial purple oval right there. I'm going to get that from the notation. I'm color coding it, right, for making it easier to understand. So purple here, there's this purple here. That's the initial super state. Again, color code purple in the sentence here. And the final state set is a cross set cross product of the initial state of, of all the states of the first machine and all the states of the second machine. And the transition function again has the same type on its new super states, Q. And it takes you from a pair of states, QI and QJ, it takes you to a new pair of states, the delta one on the QI and the delta two on the QJ, both with the X transition, X being the symbol being processed right now. So this, in terms of notation, is basically this picture in terms of intuition. I can see the correspondence between the notation and the intuition. Any questions about that? That was only half of the notation you had. Any uh, thoughts, questions? Is yeah. that a number or is it also like a, like a word pair? The, the F, the hybrid, is it a number or is it a word pair? So, so the hybrid, you can think about it either way. So it's an ordered pair, which is it's just not an atomic state. And you can number that with whatever you'd like. Call them alpha, beta, gamma, delta, you know, call them aleph, bet, even, you know, call them Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, you know, these are just labels. So either way you want to think about it is okay, but the new states are ordered pairs. But once you derive them from the ordered pairs, you can relabel them. 
and call him, you know, Larry Moen, you know, Curly, if you'd like. Uh, these are just labels. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if the alphabet is different, uh, the intersection may not contain a lot of strings in it. So for example, if I have a language over the English alphabet and a language over the Chinese alphabet, the intersection will be endless. Because no English word is also a Chinese word and vice versa, simply because of the alphabet. There's no intersection in the alphabet and much less in the actual words over the alphabet. So with that caveat, the answer is yes. Yeah, an intersect, but you have to keep that in mind if you switch alphabets around, a lot of things won't be there simply because they're not in the intersection at all. So a machine that's processing an English alphabet, when it sees a Chinese character, what will it do? A machine that's designed to process English words. Take a wild guess. It'll hang or crash. You wouldn't know, wouldn't know what to do. It's not programmed for Chinese character. No. And vice versa, a machine that's working for Chinese yet, because when it sees a Roman you know, uh, or an Arabic uh, alphabet symbol, uh, it will also hang or crash. Uh, of course, what you really want to do in situations like that is have some sort of a Unicode super alphabet that has all the characters of all the languages in it to begin with, including emojis. So then the machine can process emojis as well as symbols and you know, other things. That, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah, with, with the caveat that I just mentioned. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can cross machines regardless of alphabets. Uh, except, you know, the hybrid machine will, might crash a lot, so just keep that in mind. And by crashing, we mean not accepting. There's nothing, there's nothing terrible about crashing theoretically. It's a not accepting mode, that's all it is. Uh, of course, in practice, crashing is not just a rejection mode. It's also, uh, you know, characteristic of a bad product. You don't expect an iPhone to crash. You want it, you know, if the iPhone wants to reject what you just typed into it, you don't want it to crash and die. You want it to say, oh, you know, input not recognized, or retype this again, or some, some nice graceful error message, and then revert to some other state that would allow you to do more things. So but theoretically, you know, it's equivalent to a crash. All right, so this is called the cross product construction because we're crossing the two state sets right here. And this cross product construction will get a lot of mileage out of it. It will be used you know, probably half a dozen to a dozen other times in the course besides this one. Maybe, maybe, maybe two dozen times even. It's, it's, it's one of those concepts like dovetailing and diagonalization and pigeonhole principle where you, know, you should really get comfortable with this kind of technique because it will be used again and again in many other scenarios. Some of them will be much more complicated than this. Any other thoughts or questions about any of this? How many understand everything that's going on here? At least conceptually. Okay, good. If I give you two machines to find out how you'll be able to construct a cross product machine that accepts it. How many say yes? Yeah. Okay, good. Yes. About a third of you. I'll take that. You give it this the first time you're exposed to it. By next week, it should be most of you. So you should read about it in the book and play with J flap and you know, get yourself comfortable with all this. Yeah. Uh, so the cross product, uh, these cross product states will have all possible first state in the first machine and all possible second states from the second machine in general as the state set of the super machine. But not all of them are in this picture here. In this picture, you see only the ones that involve transitions from the initial state based on a particular string that I didn't tell you what it was. The string maybe hello world, but I didn't say that. But for that particular string, these are the positions of the first, these are the positions of the second, and these pairs are the positions of the super machine for that particular string. For another string, you'll have a different set on either side. But if you take all possible Q1 cross Q2, everything will come from that set and from that set only because it covers all possible pairs. Uh, but not all possible pairs are necessarily predicted and are, are presented or depicted in this particular picture on the right, just, just so we know specifically what's what's going on in this picture, and what this picture doesn't represent necessarily. Good question. Any other thoughts? All right. So the union preserves regularity. 
How would you prove that now very succinctly, given the previous slide? The super state set. Yeah, super state Yeah, which is what is a ten minutes ago. So he was solving a problem now that's on this slide. Uh, so have the cross product construction, but have his final states super states which have either the left or the right member <laughs> of the ordered pair being final state in his respective machine. Either or is fine, or both is fine too. Or you can use the Morgan's law. That's an easier proof. This is an alternate proof. Here's how it would work. So we already know that complementation preserves regularity. How many remember that? What's a short proof? One sentence proof. Complementation preserves regularity. One sentence. Yeah. Flip final and final states. In other that gets you the complement. That's what the complement is. Preserves regularity. The intersection preserves regularity. Right? Uh, in two words, why does intersection of two regular language regular? Why does intersection preserve regularity? Two words? Somebody else? Yeah. Parallel simulation? Or if you had to pick another pair of words, that's correct, but pick another phrase, two words? Cross product. Same, same concept, two different phrases. Okay, but the Morgan's Law says that the union of two things is the complement of the intersection of the complements. How many have seen that, believe that, know it's true? Okay, easy to prove, it's clear, it's just a couple of lines of proof. But look at what's happening here. We want to see if the union preserves regularity. We don't know that yet, let's say. But we know that the intersection preserves regularity and the intersection does the preserve regularity. So if you take this language L1, take the complement, that must be regular too, by negating in the final and non-final state. L2 complement, that's regular too. You have two regular things stay at the intersection. That's regular too, by the gross product construction of the previous slide. And if you take the complement of that up here, that's regular too, because complementation, complementation reserves regularity yet again. So the whole right side is regular if L1 and L2 were regular. How many can see that? Yeah, the, all the operators preserve this property, so the property is preserved on the entire right side, but the right side is the left side, the left side is the union. So union must preserve regularity too. How many see the theorem now, based on the Morgan's law? Now, this proof by the Morgan's law is a lot easier than this proof here, when we also circle these other states. This state here, the super state here, because it has one of them being read, and this state here, the super state here, because it has the first one being read. That'll get you the union as well. How many get that? Okay. So why didn't we use the Morgan's law on the previous slide? You know, why? So, you know, so here we're depicting what, what I just said, that you can say, okay, this is final here, and that's final here, and that'll get you the, the union. But the Morgan's law proof was so much shorter, it's one line. So why didn't we use that proof on the previous slide, the Morgan's law, end of story? Exactly. They, they depend on each other. This, this Morgan's law proof depends on the previous proof, and the proof that we had prior to that, based on complementation, preserving regularity, and so on, by inverting final line. So there's a dependency here. You can't just circularly argue. So once you lay down one proof the hard way, like we did in the previous slide, you can use that as a subroutine or a lemma, if you will. Uh, a lemma in mathematics is, is, a, is the equivalent of a subroutine in computer science. How many get that? Yeah. Just use it as a lemma. And then, don't have to prove the lemma anymore, you just use it as a building block and prove other things using the lemma, same as following a subroutine. Uh, so we use the proof in the previous slide as a lemma or a subroutine to establish this proof using the Morgan's law, but now the proof flees in the file. And many other proofs will have that character now. You prove one or two things the hard way using heavy machinery from first principles, and then you use them as lemmas, as building blocks, as subroutines, if you will, to prove many other things beyond that, like we just any questions about what just happened? So now we can prove more properties in rapid fire succession. We don't have to start from scratch every time with super states and all that. 
but it's important that they understand the concept because you know that, that won't happen again and again. So set difference preserves regularity. If you have a language minus another language, why does that preserve regularity? Well, one is you can have a power set or a cross product construction saying you know a minus b. You know, so if the first accept and the second doesn't accept, you're good, right? If both accept, you're not good because it's a minus. So this must accept. This must accept and this must not accept. So all, only states of super states of this nature will be in the super machine representing the difference between the languages of the two machines respectively. How many get that concept? Okay. Or you could use the set identity saying the difference between two languages is the first in the second with the complement of the second. How many believe that this is true for arbitrary sets? Never mind just languages. Okay, this is true. The difference between two sets is everything in the first that's also not in the second to be subtracted away from it and then not being in the first. So once you do that, you see that difference preserves regularity. Why? Because complementary complementation preserves regularity two theorems ago. Right? And intersection preserves regularity, last theorem on the previous slide. And therefore, the difference preserves regularity because the whole right hand side preserves regularity. And therefore the left hand side preserves regularity. But that's the difference in two languages. How many get this proof? Okay. Or you could have done it the hard way, of course. That's doing heavy lifting without good reason. And now you can do lots and lots of other, you can say XOR preserves regularity. XOR means it's either in the first or the second, but not in both. So you can do it the hard way by saying, okay, you know, this is a final state, this is a final state, but that's not a final state because it's in both. So it's not an XOR situation, it's, it's, it's an N situation. So, so you know, you know, or you can use a set identity that the XOR of two sets is the union of the, first, of the two minus the intersection of the two. So it's in one or the other, that's the union, but not in both, that's the intersection. How many get that? But the extra of two things is their union minus the intersection. So we already know the union preserves regularity. Right? How do we know? So right here, this thing. We know that the intersection preserves regularity. How do we know? Previous slide. The difference preserves regularity. How do we know? Right there. And so the extra preserves regularity. And so do many other things. Right? Um, so you know, kind of a meta theorem here, a piece of wisdom, is that you know, identity-based proofs once you establish these general set identities are much easier, simpler, more succinct, and more elegant than proof using first principles, doing heavy lifting, or constructing you know, hyper or super machines with, with, with lots of extra states and cross product extraction, although either one works. So now we have two different proofs for all these new theorems, and we've proved a whole bunch of new theorems in rapid succession, and we'll prove many more. And this brings us to non-determinism, and in the book that's roughly section 1.2, page 47, 48, 49. And non-determinism is when you have several possible next states. You know, it's a very interesting concept. So instead of the transition function looking like this, like one state goes to another state, goes to another state, deterministically, instead of having a linked list, a long list of states, you're allowed to have several next states, so the computation now starts bifurcating and looks like a tree rather than a long list. And now determinism is a very deep subject. All of the completeness is based on it, complexity theory, and we'll study it you know, quite a bit. We'll see examples. Uh, but there's an interesting, just to kind of jump ahead a little bit, there's a movie with uh, Nicolas Cage called Next. Have you ever seen it? It's not a, you know, it's never, you know, in, 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 in danger of winning an Oscar or anything like that. But it's about a guy who has a superpower, but not like Superman, you know, Flash or Aquaman or Wonder Woman. His superpower is non-determinism. His reality can split and bifurcate and can parallel experience several different alternate universes and pick the one he prefers and stay with that. Think about that. So for extra credit, you can watch this movie. How many professors do we movies for extra credit? Well, my gift to you. Uh, keep that non determinism definition in mind as you watch it. We'll talk more about it next week. See you later.
they're actually not bad. They're, they're less than any. Uh,